Hey guys, it's Ruben from Dove here on Connection Loop, our podcast, and I'm with Stephen Cooley. Stephen actually had, I think, stumbled upon Dub on his kind of path to do research on video providers, I think specific to the mortgage industry. So I'm really kind of curious to explore how you discovered Dub, but I'm also very curious to understand what it is that you're doing in your business and some of the strategies that you're starting to employ and recommending your clients. So Stephen, please tell me about yourself. What are you up to? Well, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, so my company is called Art First Math, and we're a uh, strategy business intelligence consultancy. We focus on finance and software companies. Video is obviously a huge prescription in everything that I do. If it comes down to social media content or you know, kind of unique entries like email marketing, and there are several providers. But what kind of drew me to Dub was the analytics skew and the value proposition and the actual tracking that you have integrated into your platform. And I think that's a constant challenge with software, especially third-party marketing softwares, is just quantifying that value and really understanding how that service you know, creates a value for the enterprise or the business. And I really appreciate you saying that. I mean, it is about the data. That's a big part of what we do. One of the things that we realized was that video is powerful. It helps build trust. It helps streamline calm. It really helps drive revenue. It helps close deals for people in sales, but it also helps lift brands and to create sort of magical kind of storytelling opportunities. But the reality is that if you don't know what's happening on the other end, if you don't know if people are receiving your videos, if they're watching them, if they're actually moving down your funnel, if they're clicking on calls to action, what good is it? What value is it? You know, we all love YouTube. We're very active on YouTube. We have a daily show on YouTube, but we don't use YouTube for videos that are kind of sales and sort of marketing in nature because we want to know, especially if they're sent on a one-on-one basis, because we want to know if people are watching those videos, what percentage of the video watched, and then also to get that data integrated into our CRM. We use HubSpot. We also use Modic. It's an open source marketing automation platform. But having that real-time data also through the Dub dashboard, that's been really helpful for us. What would you say is the really the problem that the video can solve specific to the mortgage industry? I think it is such a personalized, large purchase. I mean, it's a big deal when you're buying a house and you're talking about the biggest purchase of your life as far as you know your finances are concerned. And you know you have to create a, a very unique relationship with your borrower. They have to trust you. They really have to trust you. And sending an email is one thing, but you know connecting a email with a face right out of the gate is, I think, a pretty big deal. And I think it creates a comfort immediately and a connection with that loan advisor. And you know it allows that consumer to feel a little bit more comfortable about that process. And I mean, in mortgage as well. And we talked about you know one of my prospect is a document aggregator. And so not only do you have to trust this person, but you're about to hand over some really personal documents about yourself, you know? And so I think that just, it it creates a warmth to that transaction, especially in the initial stages of, you know, meeting somebody and learning how they're going to help you solve your mortgage problem. No, I love how you articulate that. You know, I'm thinking back to the loan transactions that I've done, and I don't think I've ever actually met one of my loan officers before in person. It's all been virtual, mostly emails. And you're absolutely right about that. And I think that what has happened is that it's taken me a long time to want to commit myself to someone. If I can't see the person, if I don't know where they work, if I don't have that social proof, that validation, that trust factor, you know, I really struggle with that. And I think the more crap that we're seeing on the internet and the more scams and the more kind of scary, frightening stuff that people are getting exposed to now, people are having more trust issues. Um, And I think even with, you know, millennials and kind of younger folks, they're more used to seeing real-time data-driven proof, you know, pictures, videos, real-time data. I think that's really what the mindset is. So I couldn't agree with you more about that. I think that's really going to help solve a lot of problems. I think overall, though, my frustration is that I just haven't seen a lot of adoption specific to mortgage. I haven't seen a lot of people in the mortgage industry starting to use video. And my thesis is that there's some bureaucracy. I could be wrong about that. But, you know, does do the big companies, do they approve that? Do they allow their staffers or independent contractors or sometimes franchisees to be able to leverage technology like Dub to use video for sales? absolutely do. I mean, I think your first barrier is your average loan officer is like 53 years old. And so, I mean, you're taking a very, you know, modern technology and introducing it to a generation that is actually used to writing letters. And not to speculate too much about that age demographic, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I mean, I'm 37. And for me, the barrier is like, man, I got to look at myself and confidently, you know, put together my message and then send it off. So, I mean, you have a couple variables there that are challenging. And with mortgage in general, 
general, the other challenge is compliance. I mean, any marketing vehicle that is that is going to be utilized to reach the public, they do have to consider, you know, the compliance ramifications of that vehicle. So, I mean, it can make it a little bit challenging for a third-party marketing service to get involved in a compliance-governed, you know, business industry. I mean, it terrifies some of those guys. And what are the implications? What are the risks of that? I want to understand that. I think there's something a little bit different of with a live video, so to speak, than a actual thought out text and how it's actually put together. I mean, I think that's the nerve that, that is connected to it. I mean, you know, social media scares them too. I mean, anything that goes out into the, and lives somewhere in your cloud or in any place that, you know, could be skewed and impact consumers, it just gets a little daunting. And obviously there's protections in place um, and there's security and whatnot. But I mean, nonetheless, I mean, it makes those folks nervous. That's fair. I think that's totally understandable. And I think that, you know, I want to constantly think of ways to provide best practices, consultations, kind of tutorials to help people to be able to overcome that both from an emotional perspective, but then also from a logistical or even legal perspective. I mean, some of the solutions that I can think right off the bat when dealing with something like that is to keep the video content the human content, the relationship building content, yeah. not about the terms, not about the points, not about the stipulations of the contract. You know, have the introductions, have the follow ups, have the happy birthdays, have the, you know, loan anniversaries, have the meet and greets, the referral thank yous. You know, have those messages appear in videos on webcam, sent to the person, hyper personalized. I think people will really appreciate that. And then the second thing is walkthroughs of text. So with the Dub Chrome extension, you can do walkthroughs, for example, of proposal or a contract, a term sheet potentially. Yeah, yeah. So that's in writing that's been approved. You're going to email that to a person either as an attachment or a PDF or embedded into the body of the email. You know, why not give them a visual walkthrough of that? Take them through the term sheet, take them through the points. We have an annotations tool. You can circle things, you can underline things, you can show how many points on the loans are, what the, you know, interest rate is, so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot of ways to overcome that with just being a little bit smart about the way that you record and share videos. Is it similar to, and help me understand, What's your experience with the medical field with HIPAA? I've done some consultancy for like social work or therapists or whatnot. And there's a lot of, you know, third party software. And and when you get involved in that type of business, I mean, you're wise to get like a HIPAA consultant to, you know, kind of guide you through and be like, okay, what can we do here? What can we say? What can we not say? How do we, you know, what are the protections needed to make sure that this, you know, these notes are secure or or whatnot, which is mostly what I've dealt with. Um, You know, I mean, have you had experience with that yet? Or I mean... Yeah, we definitely don't actively market to the medical industry, but we do get signups. We do get people that are using it. Actually, just yesterday, someone who's actually a doctor, a uh, family care doctor who is a neighbor of us actually in our building here in Los Angeles, and he was starting to get on the platform. He's kind of into telemedicine, yeah. and you know he's kind of exploring that. And I think the best practice there is that when you're providing medical information and that's going to get communicated over video that's going to live in the cloud, get shared, it, it, first of all, it can be on a private one-to-one basis right. within accounts, within emails. But at the same time, I think it's best practice to not necessarily include information about the person. Right. So it doesn't really add value. I think the same applies to a lot of different industries. It's to provide consultation, to provide information, to provide feedback. But why have the need to sort of include, you know, sensitive information about the person? It's not really relevant. I don't think it helps much. Absolutely. Now, and to circle back, I think that walking through the proposal element of, of what you're talking about is, is a really big deal, especially, I mean, there are certain, well, I mean, well, like seniors, for example, or whatnot, or there's certain demographics that absolutely need that additional consultation with certain types of loans or, or 203Ks or reverse mortgages or whatnot are, are complex you know, financial vehicles that absolutely need more attention. And they, you know, having, getting to look at somebody and walk through it in that manner, I think is a big deal. Yeah. People don't read as much as they used to. And the other thing is that if you give someone a document with a lot of noise on it, a lot of information, a lot of data points, they don't know where their eyes should go. They don't know what to sort of look at. I mean, you know, 3M and the highlighters and the post-it notes and the little arrow stickies, those things were invented for a reason. Now we have digital versions of those. So we actually spent a lot of time with our annotations tool because we want people to be able to do call outs and then have a video sort of dialogue based 
explanation of that so that when the person's watching a video, they understand every element of this, let's say, term sheet. They understand what everything means, what the stipulations are, what the realities are, what the implications are, because there's a guiding consultant on the other side that's just explaining them the whole process. So I think the larger takeaway, at least from my perspective, is that it's not about sales anymore. Now it's about consultation. It's about guidance. It's about providing information. It's about really giving people valuable things so that they can make better choices to ultimately, you know, live better, healthier, happier lives, really. What you're really talking about is customer service. You know, yeah. there's a guy named Jay Bear wrote a book and, and I don't know if he coined this phrase or not. We discussed it, but the customer service is the new marketing was mm. the cool phrase that I really have taken to heart. I mean, and, and that really is the case. It's, you know, how do we find tools and new ways to actually elevate that customer service experience to create continuous residual business and, you know, help our customers have a solution for the problems. I love that. Customer service is the new sales is the new marketing. I totally agree with that. You know, I'd add one thing to that, that now it's also about leveraging content. So as you serve customers and as you support them to have content that helps them, videos, white papers, eBooks, blog posts, articles, anything that's going to help people that's visual that they can kind of consume on their own time. People are really going to appreciate for that. You know, my favorite sales people that I've worked with are excellent at customer service they're available they're transparent they're honest they have all the right information they help me down a path you know help me overcome fears and issues and problems so i completely agree with you on that absolutely content is getting more empathetic all the time and i think that video is probably a big part of that right i mean i'm able to almost read my customers mail almost you know and really get on their level quicker and be more relatable and help them understand you know that i am the authority on this and i'm able to help them with their challenges yeah so what are kind of some best practices that you would recommend what are some of the things that you do in your business to really get best sort of customer service customer happiness and ultimately referrals Absolutely. I mean, I mentioned empathy. I think that's probably where I start. I think I'm doing business to business, you know, sell for the most part. You know, when I enter a a business engagement, it's really about trying to understand the pain points and then understand that marketplace and understand, you know, how the solutions that they have are, you know, fit into that marketplace and where the barriers are and what the challenges are within that business that they're not able to reach their objectives. Sometimes it's literally identifying those objectives, you know, and I think you hear all the trendy uh, keywords and buzzwords that we hear in the marketing place um, get a little annoying for me, right? I mean, you know, like, oh, we have these KPIs. And it's like, well, why do you have those KPIs? Like, like <laughs> helping them just understand you know, what are the true indicators that are that's going to move their business forward and help them find the success that they're looking for and figuring out strategies and also helping them with their business intelligence. I mean, sometimes people have a lot of information and they do have good analytics and they do have the numbers that, you know, the results of the whatever campaign that they're running, you know, but they're not really sure what they mean. And so developing a strategy and helping them understand, you know, what those analytics are telling them and what the next steps might be are the things that I'm doing to help businesses grow their business. I love that. Talk to me about art versus math. Where did that name come from? I was a digital marketing director at a a rather large bank four or five years. And in my experience with marketing, you have this combative relationship between the creative and the analytical. And I managed quite a few folks and analytics teams and and hyper creatives. At any given time in a business cycle, especially when you're dealing with marketing, it's easy if you're an analytical math person to look at Google Analytics or look at the marketplace. And sometimes that tells you exactly the direction that you need to take it. And then you'll talk to a creative person that might just have the craziest idea or a really neat way to talk about a business or a service or a product and you should lead with that so i mean i think marketing is this really cool combination of those two things is, is art and math and at any given time one or the other could be the best way to approach a marketing campaign a business strategy or a campaign I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, Our biggest X factor here is always the creativity. It's always the art that we come up with, whether it's the campaigns that we come up with or color schemes or the way that we design our product or a booth. You know, there's so many kind of creative artistic choices that we're making. And those are the things that always set us apart. And then from a math perspective, you know, being data driven to figure out what's working, how do we iterate, what are our learnings, where are our successes, where are our failures, being able to kind of iterate, improve and adapt based on that information, that model has been really valuable for us. So it's creativity 
and then data to figure out what's working and what's not working. We just rinse and repeat that constantly. And guess what? There's a lot of failures in that. Yeah. Uh, that's a big factor of what we do. We'll come up with campaigns that just don't work and Absolutely. we'll learn from it, you yeah. know? And that's a lot of fun actually. So we kind of lean into it. Sometimes we make fun of ourselves, but we always encourage that. So I love that, you know, art and math. That's a very good distinction and articulation of that. And so talk to me about your journey. So how did you end up in that chair? I mean, what got you to sort of where you are? I mean, did you start in this industry? Did you end up in this industry? Was it an accident? I always like to ask people these. Yeah, I have managed to force got my way into a pretty awesome career. I started, I cut my teeth in the print industry, wholesale digital printing, like uh, oversized billboards and whatnot. And I sold that to sign shops for seven, eight years. And then I was really badly wanted to be Mark Zuckerberg. And so I started a social media advertising software company and did the whole money raise thing. And, and I quit that job and I launched that platform. And then within that, I also started a software development company because of some of the resources that became available as a result of the other one. I ran those for about three years and then almost lost everything. And I decided I really wanted to get into the financial sector. And I got a job as a loan officer at this bank. And so I started, really started over. And uh, as I was sitting there waiting to get licensed, I noticed that their online assets weren't that great. And so I wrote a Jerry Maguire style memo and my team leader or whatnot grabbed that memo and handed it to this VP of the call center and he called me down to the office. I thought I was going to get fired speaking out when I shouldn't have because I was just a low low guy in the totem pole. And when I got into his office, he looked at me and was just like, can you do this stuff? Can you actually aggregate business online? Can you actually, and at the time it was a reverse mortgage company. And you know, so the market was seniors. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I think I could do this for you. And uh, so I got super promoted at that moment and had a lot of success and uh, continued to get promoted at that company and uh, just kind of fell in love and developed an expertise for enterprise marketing in the finance space. I've worked with a lot of software companies and high-level agencies that work with Fortune 100 companies and have learned a lot over the course of my career. And so it's been quite a trip. I was a signed musician, you know, in a previous life. And so growing up, I thought I was going to be a rock star, but now I'm this. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have aspirations of being a rock star as well in my history. So I'm a drummer. I've got two guitars here. I got a drum right to my right, and then a ukulele. So awesome. I haven't given it up completely. Still, still got a little band, but yeah. uh, you know, we get together probably once every four months. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's a big part of what I do. I started my adult life as a teenager playing music, having fun with that. And I don't think I've ever stopped. There's always been a beat in what I've done, you know, whether it's coming up with our workflows or coming up with the music that we're adding to our videos. It's all been some sort of a composition and some music has been a big part of that. You know, I've got an Alexa next to me and I'm constantly asking her to play me songs that yeah. I'm reminded of. So music's a big part of my life. What genre did you play in? I was like blue eyed soul. Cool. Yeah. I think you're hard pressed to find a marketer that doesn't have some sort of creative background, whether it's music yeah. or art or dance or, you know, painting miniature figurines or, you know, building train sets or, I mean, like any marketer that identifies as a marketer has probably got some sort of creative acumen, uh, you know, either traditional or non, you know. Well, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, when you take creative energy, the channeling of creative, and then you apply that to kind of business and to career goals, if you clone someone else's campaign, and then you think that that's going to work in the same way, it's probably not. You have to make it your own. Absolutely. And we encourage that always, especially being a video provider, because if you're just recording drab, boring, uncreative videos on a white background with nothing interesting to say, no interesting props, no interesting sort of storytelling, you're not going to get people's attention. You know, if you start to think creatively about how to communicate, whether it's to have a nice backdrop, like what I'm seeing on your end right now with some cool colors, a nice painting, although I don't know what character that is in that painting, so I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> Looks like a Disney character. Yeah. But, you know, it's that creative storytelling, you know, right. and thinking outside the box that really, I think, helps people. It's very similar to writing a song, actually. Absolutely. No, I mean, and with video too, I, this is it's a learning curve for me as well. Um, using your normal talking style and being genuine and not, you know, you, you just see so much video of, of guys that are, you know, they're sitting up straight and there's this, you know, there's, there's this like square, you know, way to do it. And that's not necessarily the best way. I mean, you have to be authentic. You have to be genuine and, and you have to, you know, speak the way you always would so that you can make that connection. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm really curious to get some feedback from you as you start to use Dub, as you start to use the platform for prospecting or 
nurturing leads, following up, providing value, providing information. Do you have any kind of feedback for me or any suggestions or any ways that we can sort of improve Dub as a platform and as a company? Right now, no. I mean, I'm excited to see, you know, my always challenge with like third party is really understanding the ROI stuff, you know, and I, and I love the CTA. I'm still getting into it and still sending out, but I had a great success story yesterday, I reached out to somebody that I've been trying to get a hold of for about a month, you know, for some project that I'm working on. And, and they saw the video and they're like, you know, I get thousands of intros like this and I've never gotten one like this before, you know, a really creative intro. And it was just me saying, Hey, Hey man, I, I've been trying to get a hold of you, you know? And so I just wanted to reach out again and, and see when you might be available. And I finally booked that meeting. So, you know, that was a pretty awesome experience that I had literally, you know, less than a week into, you know, utilizing your platform. So I, I'm pretty excited to see, utilize the CTA, you know, functionality and really understand, you know, what the difference between just, you know, shooting emails out and going, hey, I talked to you. And then, you know, and I have HubSpot too, right, which has a lot of great features to track the performance of those things. But that, that's really my nerdy hang up is just understanding how, you know, do I see an increase in conversion to meetings? You know, I think that's going to be a great metric to track. Well, here's a couple of things right off the bat that I, I might guide you to do is number one is integrate a calendar into your Dove video page. So sure. we have a couple of nice integrations with Calendly, with the QD scheduler, with Book Like a Boss, with actually the native Outlook. Um, even I think if Google has some sort of a public URL, I think it works for there too. But we encourage that. Give people sure. the booking option directly on the video page. So that's the first recommendation that I have. You'll see a lot of lift on that. It's just, it works really well. The second thing is we recommend for people to be expositional about their call to action. And what I mean by that is click on the button below or sure, sure. pointing down, sure. you know, below is my calendar. Just book a time that works for you. The next thing is that some people don't like to click. Some people don't like to sort of engage with those calls to action. Give them the option to respond to this email. You know, if you are indeed emailing them a video, you can say, you can also respond to me via the email. We've seen a lot of success with that. And then the last thing I would say is just constantly be focused. And I, I think you're already doing this is constantly be focused on the value. You know, what value can you provide? Here's a valuable asset. Click on the button below to view that, to watch that, to see that, to learn from that. Like, what is it that they can click on? If it's not so salesy in nature, they're more likely to check it out because it might help them. Right. And I would say that the ultimate thing that I would recommend is sometimes it's nice if people see something that they're familiar with. For example, if you do a screen recording of their LinkedIn profile or their website or something that they might be interested in, you know, showing them that they're going to see the thumbnail, they're going to see an image that they kind of connect to and they're going to have some curiosity. They might be more likely to click on that. We've seen people do some really interesting things, you know, a cheers with a beer mug or cupcakes or cute dogs, right. stuffed animals. I have all sorts of random things on my desk just because, you know, I like to just show people random things that I have half a brain here. Here's a Rubik's Cube. It's a little thing for sort of exercising my wrist. So I come up with random ways to kind of entertain people, show them something kind of moderately interesting. And that seems to work for me. That's cool. But uh, listen, I really appreciate your time. Is there any other kind of takeaways? I mean, I'd love for people to know how to get a hold of you. Um, if you have any kind of value bombs that you want to give people when they're going through the loan process, would learn, love to learn, hear that as well. I have one of those website things, as we all do. It's artversemath.com. And, uh, you know, it's been exciting kind of getting to go through this process and uh, meet new people in different business sectors. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty excited about this digital mortgage conference uh, in Las Vegas. It's uh, Monday and Tuesday and uh, meet a lot of different types of software folks in the mortgage industry. And, uh, you know, so now I'm real excited to take the journey. And so I appreciate your time. Well, listen, I really appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Keep in touch about Dove. Love to see you get more success using the platform. Thank you so much, Stephen. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it.